And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and a half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring on, whose, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. You may be seated. <coughs> So last couple of studies that we've looked at through chapter number 12, uh, we've looked at this uh, ongoing great war that is happening. I call it the great war. Um, it's a war that really every other war is about. Um, it, is a, it is every war that springs forward on earth has to have something to deal with the war between Satan and God. In verses 1 through 6 on our first week of covering this chapter, we were introduced to some characters, and what we learned was, in Revelation, sometimes things are deliberately symbolic. Um, and so we were introduced to some characters. The first one was a pregnant woman who we had determined through our study was most likely Israel, representative of Israel. And then we were introduced to a male child of which she was giving birth to, and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we were introduced to the dragon, which is symbolic of Satan, and we know that beyond a shout of a doubt. The dragon stood positioned, ready to devour the child as the pregnant woman was giving birth. When the child was born, God snatched up the baby into heaven and then pulled the pregnant woman into the wilderness to protect her. Satan then, really ticked off, Warred with Michael the archangel and his holy angels. Satan and his fallen angels lost this war and was thrown out of heaven once and for all. We talked about how Satan spends some of his time in heaven and some of his time on earth. And it's really weird for us to think about the, the idea that Satan spends time in heaven, but he does so standing before the throne of God make, making accusations against you and me, trying to remind God of all the sin that we have committed in our lives and why he shouldn't forgive us course, that will all fall as a huge failure. <coughs> the final statement after Satan left was made, and this is what heaven said. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. What we see in the subsequent verses today is part of the beginning of the aftermath of Satan bringing this war to earth. So let's read again the first couple of verses just to refresh our memory. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent, serpent into the wilderness to the place where she, she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. So Satan's first move when he gets to earth is to attack the pregnant woman. And we all know the pregnant woman is who? Israel. So he goes after Israel, and this is the way it's always been. Because of God's special mark and his covenant promise with the nation of Israel. By the way, do you know that the nation of Israel is the only nation that's ever had a covenant with God? Even the United States of America, as fond as we are of, uh, of the country, of our country where we live, we've never had a covenant relationship with God. Only the nation of Israel has. And so Satan has always attacked it because that was part, Israel's been a big part of God's redemptive plan to bring forth the Messiah out of this nation. So Israel has suffered constantly. They've suffered both at the hands of Satan and they've suffered at the hands of God for their numerous failures and rebellion against the Christ. See, the Messiah that they had been waited for came and they rejected him. Because he didn't look like them. He didn't talk the way he thought they thought he should talk. He, he actually confronted their religious hypocrisy. He actually confronted their systems and their man-made traditions. And so they didn't like him. They rejected the Messiah that they had been waiting so 
long for. The difference, though, in Satan uh, causing suffering and God causing suffering is the intent. Satan intends to destroy. God intends to bring them to repentance and salvation. That's why he brings suffering. Israel has faced numerous threats throughout their existence. If you go back to uh, pre-New Testament times, you'll look all the way back to the patriarchal period between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where they had a time of famine that Joseph was able to keep them safe from. Their captivity to the Egyptians, which led to the wilderness, which led to the promised land, and all the trials that came along with that. (coughs) But even then, their pattern of rebellion and idolatry led to judgment and suffering over and over and over again. There was this pattern. In fact, you read the book of Judges. The book of Judges is really like Israel doing really well and serving the Lord their God and then them getting really comfortable and fat off the land and then apostatizing and pushing against God and then God would bring suffering and he would have surrounding nations overcome them and subdue them and he would humble them and then they would get back on their knees and say, we're so sorry, God, we've sinned against you. Sounds like a lot like us, right? Uh, It's just a picture of us. I'm so sorry, God, I messed up. Would you please forgive me? And then God restores and he brings favor and then he helps, he gives them, he he allows them to get their land back and then it happens again. And and, and Israel falls and they start worshiping idols and they intermarry with foreign women who uh, uh, they compromise and allow their idolatry to come into their land. So as you read the book of Judges, you see this period where many of the judges are corrupt Uh, They fail to uh, lead Israel to a um, consistent commitment to Yahweh. They suffer greatly. They're overtaken by other people. They lose wars. All sorts of chaos ensues um, in this whole process. Then Israel, after that, they were united under a monarchy. Most of the kings in the monarchy were corrupt and brought hardship. The monarchy was then divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Both were eventually defeated by their enemies, and they become subjugated to the authorities of foreign powers for years, such as Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. All of these major world empires ruled over the Jewish people, and they suffered greatly. Then you look at post-biblical times. Well, even through the New Testament, you look at <coughs> they were under the Roman Empire, and they had persecution. And then, of course, post-biblical times, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. Uh, You move down a thousand years, and they had issues in the first uh, crusade. They were captured, sold into slavery. King Edward banished Jews from England in 1290. France followed suit in 1306, Spain in 1492. In the Middle Ages, Jews were blamed for natural disasters. It was just easy. They hated Jews so much um, that they would just blame them for uh, natural disasters. So the Black Death was pinned on the Jews, and they were treated horribly because of that. In the 19th century, Jews were blamed for the assassination of Tsar Alexander in Russia. They were driven from their homes. Tens of thousands of Jewish people were killed. Three million Jews were killed during the reign of Stalin. And in the darkest hour of the Jewish people in the 1930s, the Nazi party came to power in Germany and their racism became public policy. They openly persecuted Jewish people in efforts to completely eliminate them. Six million Jews were slaughtered. Yet through all of this, this small group of people that possess a very tiny area of land still survives. They're not massive in number. There's just a small group, I think 7, 8 million people total that are of the Jewish population today. There's a small number, but they still survive. And even look at today, the terror group that reigns in the Gaza and Palestine, Hamas, reigns terror down on Israel. Hamas has been pestering and harassing Uh, with smaller moves on Israel for some time, but now it's escalated into a full-out war, a war that involves horrible violence done towards not just military but citizens, mass murders of children, the extraction of infants from their mother's wombs, just wretchedly horrible demonic things. And what we see is, is Israel is not like innocent. Israel has a lot of problems. And they have um, rejected the Christ. And so they face a lot of suffering at the hands of that, but also they're a target of Satan because of God's redemptive plan coming through that. What is quite shocking is that even as bad as things seem to be for the Jewish people is the tribulation will be even worse. Jeremiah called it Jacob's distress. Alas, that day is so great, there is none like it. It is a time for distress 
of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it. Now, Jacob, of course, was the son of Isaac. Jacob would be renamed to Israel. That's where the name came from uh, for the entire nation. Jesus spoke of it like this in Matthew 24, 21. <coughs> for then there will be a great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. But we know that the Lord himself has made us a promise. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 29, or he's made the Jews a promise. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them that I t- when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel... They are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God will save Israel. There will be a massive revival in the end times, in the tribulation, that will cause the Jews to finally recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. Daniel foresaw this himself. If you would turn with me to Daniel chapter 12, it's a larger chunk of scripture, so it's probably more efficient for us to just go ahead and read it directly from the text here. Daniel chapter 12. Starting in verse number one, (coughs) at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge over your people. Remember Michael, the archangel from our uh, section of text a couple weeks ago. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been, never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. Sound familiar? Um, And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, Oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall <coughs> purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. So there's a lot there that is that they would take us a lot of time to digest and go through. But essentially what you have is an Old Testament prophet that is in the first few verses here proclaiming the truth that Israel is going to be saved. Now, going back to our text, let's look at a few words and break it down here. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman. Now, the ESV renders this Greek word as pursued, but there are other such translations. You may not be able to read it. It's a little bit small, but other such, uh, uh, what's called dynamic equivalent translations, which is a mix between literal and um, paraphrase, um, which is most Bible translations. These are more on the literal side, so they're closer to the original text. So you have ESV, King James, New King James, NASB, which is New American Standard Bible. You see that pursued is used three times. Persecuted is used twice. This is the word that we often use in reference to persecution. And so the word means to chase and to hunt. It is used in the New Testament of a pursuit with hostile intent. 
So as the woman flees in the wilderness, she is chased by Satan, and Satan is going after her. So as Israel is pulled into protection from God, let's, let's track the symbolism. As Israel is pulled into protection from God, Satan is now relentlessly persecuting the Jews. Jesus gave us a picture of some of the things that would occur during this chasing. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24 now. Matthew chapter 24. This is what's called the Olivet Discourse. So Jesus is talking about what things are going to look like in the uh, end times. And this is what he says. <coughs> Matthew chapter 24, verse number 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. I'm going to pause there. Remember that Daniel just told us about the abomination of desolation. What is that? We're going to talk about that in, in, in some coming weeks. But essentially what that is, is the Antichrist is going to, uh, the, the sacrifices in the temple are going to be reinstated at some point. They're going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. The sacrifices are going to begin again. Then the Antichrist is going to stand on the altar before the entire world and say, you don't sacrifice to Yahweh, you sacrifice to me. I'm God. I'm the Messiah that's come. That's the abomination of desolation, that he would stand in the temple and demand that the world worship him, and they will. And so that's when it, you see that, that's what it's talking about. And again, we'll break that down a little bit more later. Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant... And for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So Jesus is giving us a picture of what Daniel's talking about. So what we're trying to do here is bring the Old Testament and the New Testament together to show you how prophecy always talks to each other how the scriptures always reinforce each other. So Daniel, the Old Testament prophet, then a thousand years later, Jesus comes along and reinforces it and gives us a different viewpoint on what is happening to now what we're reading in Revelation. And so what John is picturing is this idea of Satan is chasing, and he's always chased on Israel, but during the tribulation, it's going to be so terrible that if you even, Jesus is picturing it and saying, if you even turn around and go back and get your coat, you're dead. Don't go back and get your coat. Don't go back to the house and get your belongings. Don't go get your family album. Run. Run. I'll protect you, but do not go back. Do not even look back. And it's really scary to, to fathom that sort of uh, terror and tragedy, but that's, that's, that's what is awaiting. But God protects his people, and he will save Israel. And so let's go back to the verses 13 and 14. It says, but, and we see this here reinforced. He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. So he pursues, and here comes all the run out. Don't go back and get your coat. But the woman <coughs> was given the two wings. So wings in the Bible is often strength and speed. Isaiah 40, 31, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. We, a lot of us know this. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So the wings is often symbolizes strength and speed. Uh, uh, they will be given the two wings of the great eagle. Eagle is not an actual eagle, <coughs> like the bald eagle uh, of the, the uh, symbol for America, but it is a symbolic picture of protection and flight that is used in this scenario. So that she might fly from the serpent. I, I find this interesting. I'm going to pause here for just a second. Notice that we've been calling him the dragon while he's been in heaven, and now all of a sudden he's on earth. We're calling him the serpent again. I, I'm not quite sure why, but it could be that there is, a, there is a inference that when he's here, he takes on a different form, and he's being described in a different way. But when he's in heaven, they just call him a dragon. But now John is calling him serpent again. Uh, serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. So nourished would indicate that God is going to supernaturally provide food and water for the Israelites just like he did during the Exodus. For those who recall and know the story, when they were in the wilderness, what did he do? Manna, water from the rock. Manna, water from the rock. That's how he provided and sustained the Israelite period. Well, he's going to do it again. Why? Well, 
Again, we'll break this down a little bit later, but those who don't have the mark of the beast will not be able to buy and sell. You will not be a part of the world's commerce system. You will not be able to do that. So you're either growing your own stuff or you are, um, you are having to have supernatural provision. In the case of the Israelites, whatever they were growing at home in the fields is now left in the fields because remember, they got chased away. They couldn't go back and get their coat. They can't go back and plow their field before they leave. So God is going to supernaturally provide for them. Again, what does this point us to? The lots of details here, lots of nuances of the story, but what does this tell us about God? He always provides for his people. He always takes care of them. And even if they die, they will be ushered into his presence. He does not, even in the midst of this crazy attack, he does not let any one of his children be lost. <coughs> The serpent poured water, this is interesting, like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. What is this? Right, this is one of those texts where you're just like, what is going on? Dragons spew fire. They don't spew water. We have to catch the symbolism. It's highly likely this isn't actual water. But instead, oftentimes when the Bible talks about a great army, it talks about them in, in language of a great flood. So we see in Scripture and other places where great armies are symbolically represented by rushing waters. Jeremiah 46, 8. Egypt, this is the Egyptian army, rises like the Nile, like rivers whose waters surge. He said, I will rise, I will cover the earth, I will destroy cities and their inhabitants. Jeremiah 47, 2, thus says the Lord, <coughs> Behold, waters are rising. This is the army rising out of the north. It shall become an overflowing torrent. They shall overthrow the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. Men shall cry out and every inhabitant of the land shall well. So it's symbolic. The Bible has used language of rushing waters and floods to reference an army before. But then something interesting happens in the verse. The earth opens its mouth and swallows the river. Well, if you are familiar, again, with the life cycle of the Jewish people, what story in the Bible does this sound like where God opened up something and then swallowed their enemies? Yeah, yeah, the sea. And it's using the same symbolic language. Again, to the Jewish mind, they would completely understand this language because, again, God is going to, I don't know if it's going to be an actual river collapsing on the people, but I, I, I would hypothesize it's an earthquake. But either way, again, supernaturally, here it's like, it's like the Egyptians coming after him again. Here comes this great army. It's the Antichrist army. And something happens and the earth, I don't know if it closes back up. I did that for uh, just sort of humorous intent. But you can, can you see the parallels? God is again supernaturally providing for them. God again, what does he call the place of which he sweeps away the pregnant woman, Israel, for protection? The wilderness. So you see a lot of the elements from the Exodus being replayed out again. And what does this communicate to the Jewish people? That God was faithful then, and he will always be faithful. And he will always look after his people. Exodus 15, 12, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed him. That's, that's, the, that's the story of, of Moses stretching out his hand and the waters collapsing on the people. Um, <coughs> let's go on to God protects Israel supernaturally. And in verse number 17, we find something interesting here. Then the dragon became furious with a woman. He just keeps losing. He's in heaven. He's trying to accuse us before God. God says, those are my kids. Jesus died for them. You can't hold anything against them anymore. Jesus paid the price. He's mad. He, he tries to swoop up Jesus. Jesus is swooped away from him. He tries to get the pregnant woman Israel. Israel's brought into the wilderness. He's ticked off. Well, I'm going to go fight Michael. He's fighting Michael. Michael defeats him. He gets thrown to earth. Then he sends an army after Israel and the earth goes... And sucks him in. And so Satan's ticked off. Everything that he's trying to do to win this war is absolutely failing. And the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war 
on the rest of her offspring. Who is that? Us, the church. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. (coughs) This is the Gentile believers. This guy just doesn't give up. He's relentless. But there's something at the end of this verse that seems really interesting to me. I have this habit. Um, I have this habit that when I read something from Scripture and it seems out of place, I can't let it just be there out of place and skip over it. I'm like, there's, it's there for a reason. So the part that I want to point out is actually not the part that's highlighted It's this right here after the highlight. And he stood on the sand of the sea. What does that have to do with anything else? That's the question I asked when I read that first. I was like, why why did John make make an effort to write that he was standing on the sand of the sea? And then this verse came to memory, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. Everyone then who hears those words, these words of mine, this is Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, listen to the word, listen to the symbolism, and the rain fell, and the floods came. We just talked about a flood, right? And the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. Of course, all of this is building your house on Christ, building your life on the word. Sounds a lot like the people of God, the flood came, there was a satanic attack. They stood because their house was founded on the rock. It's those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. But then verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man (coughs) who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. On one side of the war, you have those who do the word of God. Christ says, I know who loves me by those who obey me. Those who build the foundation of their life on the scriptures, who build the foundation of their life on God himself. Those who do the word exhibit that they love God because they trust that his way is best. And when someone does that, no matter the, the trials and the floods and the literal armies that may come against an individual, they'll stand. They may die physically, but then they'll stand before the Lord in glory. Which is not defeat, right? Paul says, for me to die is to gain. So even if you kill me physically, you still lose. I still win. All of the storms in life can come against us, but we won't crumble. Why? Because our house is, is built to stand. It's built to stand on the rock. But Jesus, just like Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, The one who doesn't obey God's word, he built his house on the sand. And by no coincidence do we now see that Satan is standing on what? Trying to beat God. Sand. I just found that interesting. Maybe I'm drawing a parallel there that is digging too much into it. But I read he stands on the sand and I'm like, huh. Seems kind of familiar to the parable of the wise builder and the foolish builder. And everything in the Bible intertwines. Everything's intentional. So there's a reason why John wrote that down. I think it's a reminder to all of us, and that's our practical takeaway from this text today, is that if you're obeying the word and building your house on solid rock, you're on the winning side, and the flood's not going to take you out. That flood may be called cancer. That flood may be called uh, uh, rebellion of children. That flood may be called uh, financial poverty. That flood may be called loss of a job. That flood may be called um, all sorts of things, uh, trauma. But ultimately, if you build your house on Jesus Christ, you will not fall. Because even if your physical life extinguishes, you go and you you're with the presence. You you go on to be in the presence of God. You win. But if you don't do the ways of God, you're building your house on sand. And what we, what do we know about sand? First of all, I hate sand. Sand is one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of beaches. I like the water, 
but you got to walk through the sand to get to the water. And then you know when your feet get wet, you got to walk back to that sand. And what happens, guys? The sand gets in everything. It gets all over the place. And it doesn't matter how, how good you rinse them off when you leave. There's still sand in your room. That you still track sand. There's still there's sand in your shoes for months. Maybe not you, but maybe I'm not doing a good job of washing the sand off. My point is this. It's annoying. It sifts. It moves. And all it takes is a little bit of a wave to move it around. So you're either building your life on this world or you're building your life on God. <coughs> if you trust in the ways of this world, if you put your hope in the money, material things, people, your job, popularity, your looks, your house will fall because money fades. It eventually runs out, especially if you treat it like it's God. Material things break. People fell, jobs end, popularity crumbles, and looks fade. When the flood arises, will you be swept away? Will you lose your faith? And I would, again, strongly contend that an individual who loses their faith weren't, weren't ever built on the solid rock to begin with. But will you lose your faith? Will you follow false teaching, isolate yourself from the church, buy into lies about yourself and other people and God? Your tongue, will it lose its control? You will, you will plunge yourself into a world that will consume you without apology. Don't stand on that sand with Satan, but instead, as that old hymn, for those of you who have been around the church for a little while and maybe you were in a church that sung hymns, that old hymn used to say, my hope is built on, it's gonna be really hard for me not to sing this, but I'm gonna not sing it for your sake. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Build the framework of your house on Christ and you will stand every flood that comes your way. All right, so 